What does a sex trafficker look like? I started to feel like someone was kicking me in the heart. I mean, it hurt to see what's being done to the kids and how big it is. They started grooming me when I was five years old. And at the age of between eight and nine, I was sold. I saw no more than a nine-year-old, you know, going from truck to truck in just a span of 30 minutes. I did not plan on living past 21. I figured something was going to happen at some point and I was just going to die. Now that I've survived it and have made a way out of it, I just want to help other people going through it and show them that there is hope for a different life. Under the radar, you know, that's why this industry is thriving is because it goes unnoticed. And so parents need to keep that in mind when they're looking at their child's phone. They can either look at their phone and feel as if they're invading a little bit of their privacy, or you have the other side where you can't take back what's going to happen to your child if you don't. I'm Valerie Cavazos. Hundreds of thousands of children across America are sold for sex every year. It's a secret world often hidden in plain sight that a former Navy SEAL is infiltrating, all caught on camera for a soon to be released documentary. The unthinkable happens to these stolen children. And though law enforcement has tried to turn the tide on child sex trafficking, it still remains prevalent. For this former Navy SEAL Team 6 member, Craig Sawman Sawyer, the fight to eradicate it became a personal mission. We suffered a, a, a tragedy in our own family, and, uh, and that just cemented, I guess, my, my resolve. Uh, it was almost like a challenge from, from the opposition saying, you know, do you want it this bad? And, and that's when I realized that there's no stopping. I can't stop, I can't look away. Living in Pima County, Sawyer made it his mission to help extract victims and thin the herd of sex traffickers and predators anywhere in the United States, all captured on camera for his documentary titled Contraland. Do you think she's there or there's do you a, think she's at the village house? There's a good possibility. There's a lot of trucking. Sawyer describes a recent sting operation with law enforcement in Utah, where a handful of men, different ages, different walks of life, are slapped in handcuffs. And you'll see, there's no chance to escape. So this guy came in in a minivan with car seats in it. The decoy met him outside, invited him in, asked him to have a seat. He didn't have a seat. So the decoy went to go offer him something to drink. She went in the kitchen to retrieve something to offer him to drink. And I came out to start my dialogue with him. And he panicked I'm out. I'm out. and he started sprinting for the door. He bolted. And so I gave the code word for the SWAT team to come do the takedown and cuff him up. And we were watching him realize that whatever he thought his future was in his life is no more. The documentary crew traversed one of the most heavily trafficked corridors in the U.S., Beagle Valley in Pinal County where many go undetected as they make their way north of Pima County. There's pimps and there's, there's bulldogs that, that, that watch um, anybody that's coming in and alert them and they, they hide the children. While on their way sometimes to staging areas, like this abandoned house where traffickers sell children to gangs for sex slavery. And the price tag can be high. Each girl can sell between $100,000 to $150,000. Thickenly enough, a child is considered an asset as far as how much it's worth in revenue when they sell a child over and over again. Because, again, that's part of this. You can sell a narcotic once and it's consumed. Sadly enough, you can sell a child victim repeatedly. He says this dark, disturbing story of child sex trafficking must be told because it'll take the collaboration of all communities to help eradicate it. We have to address it so that we can clean it up. It's like cancer. You can't look away from cancer and have it go away. You have to face it. You have to deal with it. It's painful, it's difficult, but it must be done. And that's what we're trying to do here. The documentary Contraland is slated to be complete this summer or early fall. Valerie Cavazos, Kega 9 in your side.
Scott Brown, Special Agent in Charge, Department of Homeland Security, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security Investigations. Human trafficking is a big subject. Break it down for us, the various elements of human trafficking. So uh, human trafficking involves the transportation, uh, the harboring, uh, the provisioning of persons uh, through force, fraud, or coercion um, into forced labor or commercial sex acts. It's hard to imagine that happening still in this day and age. Uh, it's far more prolific than I think anybody recognizes, um, and certainly more than anybody wants it to be. I'm Carlos Herrera. Her worst moments seem unimaginable. Once sold for sex at five, she now hopes to lead the fight against human trafficking in southern Arizona. Given up at birth, raised in foster care until the night her life took a dark turn. I um, went through the hardest thing in my life. With no voice, no friends, and no family. I was kidnapped, and so I don't know my biological parents, I lost um, being a child because most of my time it was um, being with um, these people. I never went to school. I never knew I couldn't read or write or anything. So I missed that opportunity. Growing up in Texas is the only pleasant memory of her childhood. The rest, she says, is a blurry nightmare. They started grooming me when I was five years old. And at the age of between eight and nine, I was sold. To a powerful gang. For, it could be seven days, you know, a night, depending on who uh, they wanted me for the money. She was forced to have sex for money or face the harsh consequences. They would beat me up. They would use different objects, um, pretty much um, what they wanted to do or locked her up in an isolated room in between four walls where her misery was kept a dark secret. When I was in the closet, I thought I wouldn't make it. And so I would just just pray and, and ask, you know, God to help me because I didn't know if I was going to make it. It was you and God in that dark closet. Yes. For nearly 10 years, she says, God was her best friend and gave her the strength to continue the battle. I, I prayed and it, it was very, very emotional. Every month, sometimes even every week, she would wake up in a different city, sometimes even in a different state, oftentimes making her lose track of where she was. Being in the closet, I wouldn't even know if it was Monday or it could have been Saturday. I pretty much dissociated. But she says God soon gave her the liberty she had been searching for. After four failed attempts to escape, she finally found freedom. The hardest thing I survived. Um, sometimes I think that, um, that I'm here now. And that when I, that was happening to me, I didn't think I was going to make it out. Almost a decade later, she still lives in a life in disguise with a new identity. From name to everything. Alienated from social media, a life that brought her to Tucson, her first ever home, where organizations like Kodak have helped her recover and give her life a new purpose. She's now enrolled in school where she hopes to obtain her GED, go to college and eventually become a social worker where she'll be able to help others who have suffered the same pain she did for 10 years. A profession, she says, will help her reach one of her many dreams. That they will see me, who I am, a survivor. I'm Carlos Herrera, KGUN 9, on your side.
Hello, I'm Tom Livingston. I'm a special agent with the FBI. I work on the Violent Crime Squad in Tucson, Arizona, specifically focusing on human trafficking. Is it happening in front of our noses and we don't even realize it? Yeah, a lot of times actually it is. What we have in, in, in Arizona, in Southern Arizona, is we have a task force um, and it's called Saturn. And it's Southern Arizona Anti-Trafficking Unified Response Network. And we're the ones that go out and we proactively seek this trafficking that is happening. We'll do that with operations, uh, through hotels, uh, on the streets, over the internet and we will actually target those perpetrators that are out there that are doing this to our children. So it is out there, primarily it happens on the internet. Are these American children or are these children being brought from other countries? Uh, primarily what I see is it's American children, but I do have an investigation right now where we had Americans who were trying to entice and recruit uh, juvenile Mexicans to come into the United States for the purposes of prostitution. So this isn't just solely an issue that's happening in the United States, it's international. The suspects in the cases that I've had just over this last year have ranged from 18 years of age to in their 50s. So it's a wide, wide range of perpetrators that do these types of things. Um, we've had males and females. So we don't primarily focus on the perpetrator because the perpetrator could be anybody. So the focus is mainly on the victims. And the victims that we focus on, there's really two categories. One, we have, we have those that are drug abusers or have mental health issues, and then we have endangered runaways. And so that's primarily what we do is we don't focus on the perpetrator, we focus on finding the victims. And in 2014, NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, said that one out of every six endangered children had the possibility of being trafficked. So we're talking 1,300 runaways. If just 100 of those are endangered, and one in six of those could be trafficked, Far too often, human trafficking happens in places where we go to relax. I'm Kevin Bouton, and one group showed me how they are working hard to end human trafficking in hotels and motels. They are a hotbed for trafficking, a constant stream of people from as many different places as you can imagine. Some weary from the road, others ready for vacation. Almost nobody watching for signs of forced prostitution behind closed doors. Hotels are often the venue of choice when it comes to selling women and girls for sex. Local advocacy groups reported 75 to 100 women are prostituted every night in our area, which is why they are working to train hotel staff to spot the signs of human trafficking so they are able to report it when they see it. The Southern Arizona Anti-Trafficking United Response Network hosted this training session in January before Tucson's gem shows began. Volunteers learned how to discuss the issue with hotel staff and to leave these bars of soap. Each one has a sticker with the National Human Trafficking Hotline on it. At the front desk said that they had been educated before, but they had not received soap to place in the room. Uh, our soap is labeled with the National Human Trafficking Hotline number. The Polaris Group, which works to fight trafficking nationwide, reported more than 1,400 cases of reported trafficking in hotels and motels between 2007 and 2015. Of that total, 94% of the victims were female, almost half were minors. Now Polaris tells hotel staff to watch for these warning signs. A guest paying for a room with cash or a prepaid credit card. Someone staying for a long time but doesn't have much with them. If the guest requests a view that views the parking lot. Excessive foot traffic in and out of the room. Frequently asking for new linens and towels and if the guest seems nervous or anxious. The group says if anyone spots these warning signs, to call police. Advocates hope education leads to prevention, and eventually they can help law enforcement unravel trafficking networks. I was naive about how deep it really was and how extensive the network is, and so having come along, I've been able to get more educated, and I feel more empowered to help others. Kevin Bout, KGA 9 on your side.
She spent years of her life giving her body away for a bed to sleep in. Now she spends her time in schools, making sure our children don't end up down the same path. I'm Max Darrow, and this is her story. Hi, my name is Lisa Hansen, and I survived human sex trafficking. Her story begins in Tucson with sexual abuse starting at four years old. Ten years later, she ran away from home, terrified her parents would reject her. If they knew how I felt, if they knew how I was behaving, if they knew what I believed about myself as a result of sexual abuse, just the disgusting person that I thought that I was, um, they wouldn't love me anymore. Hansen didn't go far. She stayed in town at her then boyfriend's house for about three weeks. But three years later, she ran again, far, to Kansas, this time down a much darker road. I didn't have a place to live when I got there, so that's why I ended up on the streets. You know, I'd be standing outside of bars hoping somebody would pick me up. Um, I was dancing in strip clubs, hoping somebody would take me home. I, I did not, I did not plan on living past 21. I figured something was gonna happen at some point and I was just gonna die. Years went by and Hanson found a new path. This was all thanks to her having kids of her own. It taught her the value of love and the value of a human being. Her new mission, engage kids and teach them how to protect themselves from predators. Just kid after kid is now suffering from what's being called sextortion. This is a new branch of sex trafficking now in the digital age, according to Hansen. Predators meet kids online. They make them feel accepted and liked, all to build trust. Hansen says more and more kids are now having online sex where they are sharing nude photos and videos with people, sometimes with people they know and other times with people they've never met before. So it was never a real, I'm interested in you because you're an important person. It's I'm interested in you because you have something that I want. The most important component to me is teaching a kid what a healthy relationship looks like. This is where her father, Jerry Payton, comes into the fold. They work together at the organization called Sold No More, and they give presentations about sex trafficking to students in Southern Arizona. They're often greeted with, You're bringing somebody into your school to talk about what? Uh, the sexual abuse and sale of kids. We don't sell kids for sex in America. I mean, that's Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, somewhere. We, where are kids being sold for sex in America? The answer, he says, while many of us don't want to hear it, is all over the country, in person and online. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to hear That doesn't happen here. And you want to turn a blind eye to it. But you can't, can you? No. It doesn't make the skin crawl on the kids. No. It's their world. They're seeing it constantly. There isn't an easy fix to the problem. Hansen and Peyton both know this, but that's not stopping them from trying to help find one. They hope students will leave their presentations armed with self-defense tools and a new perspective valuing each other as human beings. Why wasn't I worth just saying, you know what, kiddo? I'm concerned about you, and I'm gonna give you a safe place to stay, free of charge. That person, that individual is priceless. You can't put a price tag on a person. Max Darrow, KGUN 9, on your side. I'm Priscilla Casper. My photographer Chris Miracle and I bring you Tucson Police Department's Human Sex Trafficking Unit. We show you an arrest made on the east side. Copy. Just 123. up here. You're gonna have to get that camera lower. Like if we lose them at this point, like that's the day. Chain link fence around the wash area. Tucson Police Department's Human Sex Trafficking Unit on the hunt to take suspected sex traffickers and pimps off the streets. After months spent working on one case, they let us in on a top secret operation. This guy Amadi is our primary offender. He has a history of meeting uh, underage women on, on uh, kind of phone apps. And what he's gonna, he does is he uh, gets the young women to uh, have sex with adult men. The goal for this mission, find out where he lives so they can get a search warrant. You guys got any questions before we roll? Yes, sir. All right, let's go. 
Cops radio check. Sergeant Benjamin Free runs the unit. Uh, the cops I roll with, they came to hunt. He says a mother reached out believing her daughter had been trafficked after meeting this man online. You get online and you're just you're swimming with the sharks, so she was playing around with these internet apps that, you know, she kind of came into contact with our primary suspect and you know these guys are pretty slick. Sergeant Free says typically these chats begin with innocent photos. Got serious real quick and the next thing you know this guy's arranging um, for adult men to sleep with a, a juvenile. He says some women are so deep in the relationship they don't realize they're being taken advantage of. Sergeant Free says men will often manipulate girls and women by buying them clothes and food, even drugs. It's just you and me and I'm willing to do this for you, but what are you willing to do for me? He says a bulk of the sex trade is online because it's more convenient for sex buyers to schedule when they want it. Sergeant Free sees women and men of all ages in Tucson being trafficked, but primarily women in their teens to late 20s. And the sad thing about it is the amount of money these men make off these women can be absolutely staggering. As we wait, his team locates their suspect, Amadi. So this is our dude today, what he's wearing. Why? It sounds like they're on the move now. That's our car right there. No, this this uh, CRV, muddy CRV. He's out of the road, running south. Why is he running? Yeah, I don't have a visual of him. Uh, right now. If they lose him, they'll have to start all over. These are dangerous dudes that we need to get off the streets, and like we're here to pursue them and put them in jail where they belong. All right, I got him. He's running uh, north on Stone now. He's going back towards. He's running across the library. Officers trail him all day. He gets back into a car with two older women, gets dropped off at a bus stop, gets into another car with a younger woman, and goes to an apartment Sergeant Free says they didn't expect. The suspect unknowingly gave them a big tip. All right, awesome job today, guys. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you on the big one. Now, officers learn of a third place to look for more evidence. It's two days later. <laughs> A detective has made plans to meet Amadi and another man, Nikolai. They think they're going to have sex with a 13-year-old girl. We got deals out to both of these dudes. Hopefully, both of them show up. Still happy if one of them shows up, but sometimes none of them show up. So suspect number one, Amadi, um, he's currently out on release pending trial for two sexual assaults, one of them with a knife and one of them with a gun. They're worried about Nikolai, who was a former corrections officer. So you know he has law enforcement training, He's had access to uh, weapons. Uh, additionally, he has uh, like posted pictures on Facebook with him holding an AR-15. He just texted that he's on his way. Keep an eye on that Kia. That kind of looked like our suspect. Okay, glass break. Uh, another text came through. He's asking where she's at. No, I'm pretty comfortable with it being our guy. Um, I, I think we should roll in on this dude. All right, we'll take him. Slot start rolling. Is that a positive ID? That's our guy. Officers arrest Nikolai on a number of charges, including child sex trafficking. Amadi never showed up, but didn't get away. A couple days later, the unit served a search warrant at Amadi's home and arrested him. He faces multiple charges, including child sex trafficking as well. Two guys off the streets. Now the unit goes back to work hunting for others. Priscilla Casper, KGUN 9, on your side. I'm Craig Smith. Sex trafficking victims trying to leave that world often find it will not leave them. They almost always have a criminal record that keeps them from building new and better lives. My name is Rachel and I was sex trafficked for about six years. 
None of the women you will meet here feel comfortable showing their faces or using their real names. They are at the Gospel Rescue Mission, working to build new lives, but their old lives keep holding them back. Rachel has a record of drug charges and is fighting to beat her addictions. It's hard to explain that to people that I meet or if I'm trying to look for a job. And um, there's also a gap of six or seven years of no work history that I can't really explain. My name's Tiffany and I've been involved with sex trafficking um, a number of times in my life. Over about how many years would you say? Um, mainly from the age of 13 to 15 and in my early 20s. The criminal record most trafficking victims acquire can ruin their chances for an honest job. I've developed um, seven felony convictions on my record and I've been to prison multiple times and I have only worked maybe three years out of my whole life. I try not to share it too much but um, I have a really big fear of judgment and I usually run from situations. This is the first time I've actually been able to um, try and follow through with doing something different in my life. Sometimes in jail, the women learn about Gospel Rescue Mission. It offers a safe, structured environment to help them build a future far better than their past. So the classes that we offer, like the Healthy Relationship Boundaries class, um, can help them succeed, help them reach sort of an inner peace to help them succeed. We also class, we also offer uh, helping people get a GED, teaching them job search skills, learning how to write a resume, learning how to do an interview, to build their confidence up so they can get back into the world. And in a job market where so many people apply by computer, a criminal record carries even more weight. On black and white, I look horrible, but if you were to meet me in person, I'm a good person. And so it's, um, it's just that struggle of getting past um, people looking at an application online or something and looking up your name and what it could show anywhere. But if they were to meet me, it'd be a totally different thing. Both Tiffany and Rachel say they want to find work helping others make the escape they are working to accomplish right now. Now that I've survived it and have made a way out of it, I just want to help other people going through it and show them that there is hope for a different life. Craig Smith, KGUN 9, on your side. Where is it happening? Where are these these juveniles, these victims? Where is it? Could it be my next door neighbor and I just don't know about it? Where is this human trafficking happening? Everywhere, everywhere and anywhere. So when we do our, our proactive operations, we'll target hotels all around the city of Tucson and I'll just focus specifically on Tucson because that's what I, I know the best. All around Tucson, the hotels, we will target those hotels. Um, it's also in people's homes. So it's happening all over the country. And that's why it's important for us as the FBI to be involved in these task forces. And why it's so important is because we have a reach to all the different task forces that are around the country. How do you uncover these rings? So the best way we uncover them is, again, the proactive operations that we do. And then a lot of it is reactive as well. So we get tips. So you have the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NICMIC, and they will provide us tips, and we will follow up on those tips. We've got tips from the public, and those tips from the public have led us to victims. Where we need to focus is mainly on the parents, the guardians, and friends. Parents, guardians, and friends are the ones that are gonna be able to see a potential trafficking victim before anybody else. And the, what they can look for is changes of behavior. And I understand we're talking about children and puberty and there are going to be changes of behavior I'm talking bigger changes of behavior um, their grades are went from A's now they're down to F's uh, they're, cha they're, they, they're dressing differently they're talking differently than they had uh, they have money that you didn't give them where did you get the money they have electronic devices such as cell phones that you didn't give them where did they get it 
they're wearing clothing that they haven't worn before, which is totally out of there what they usually wear. Where did you get that clothing? If they have a new hairstyle, who paid for, who paid for your hair to get done? If they have nails that are done, who paid for your nails to get done? Things of that nature should be, should be tips. If they're chronic runaways, things of that nature, those would be indications to us that that child is an endangered runaway and we should look further into them. I think we will be able to get a handle on it. And again, I think the way we do that is we continue to um, use task forces. They're force multipliers. They reach a vast area that the federal government alone can't reach and law enforcement at a local and state level can't reach. Because of the internet, it's going to continue to be a problem. But if we save one child, just one child, then that's a success. I'm Valerie Cavazos. Sex slavery happens hidden in plain sight in our own backyards, literally in Julie's case. People have the idea of sex trafficking is it's always the person's being stolen or kidnapped or brought in from overseas, which that does happen quite a bit, but it's not always the case. Julie does not want her identity known, but shares with us how she became a child victim in her Phoenix suburban home. She says an immediate family member groomed her for sex trafficking starting at age six. So it started with little things and then kind of to warm me up into uh, the idea of sexual things happening. When she turned 11, she was sold for sex. First time that it happened, it was uh, my trafficker took me into our backyard and had um, gentlemen lined up in the backyard and basically was like, how much do you, how much would you pay for her? And then it was one by one, we were taken in my room. And Julie lived, she says, in constant fear. The guys <laughs> used like a lot of intimidating techniques. There was a lot of, I guess, violence, I would say, involved. She had been told her life, filled with sex and violence, was normal. I would say about 14 or 15 is when I started to look at other um, people's families and realizing that something was off with ours. Um, but it just caused confusion because like those are, like my family's supposed to protect me. Is what they're saying true? Like, is this my purpose? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Because my family's telling me that. Shame and fear kept her from speaking up. She remained a deep, dark secret in her neighborhood, never on the radar for a rescue. The backyard and bedroom encounters continued over and over until Julie turned 18. She grabbed what she could and left, cared for by friends willing to help her cope with a lot of emotional baggage. I had, you know, an eating disorder. I was self-harming, um, anxiety, depression, PTSD. It's these heartbreaking situations that is leading Tucson police officer, Sarah Hott, to start an equine ranch, Beauty from Ashes, with the purpose of providing a sanctuary for recovery. We as law enforcement don't um, have anywhere to send them. They go, they end up right back in that life. Julie is now in graduate school with a mission to help other innocent victims who are sold for sex. Valerie Cavazos, Kega 9 on your side. I'm Jennifer Martinez. How one organization here in Tucson is hoping to end human trafficking, not only throughout Arizona, but the world. Under the radar, you know, that's why this industry is thriving is because it goes unnoticed, you know. The number of victims human trafficked is unknown, but more and more are escaping and surviving. What we do see is um, more survivors around the country being rehabilitated. It's a big step to end human trafficking, not only here in Arizona, but around the world. Maggie Bellino with Southern Arizona Against Slavery says there is still work to be done. After taking over this organization in 2017, it's heading in a new direction. It's trying to figure out where the gaps are in the community because it's my fear that there's a lot of 
nonprofits in Southern Arizona that are working to eradicate sex trafficking, but we're not working together. I feel like there's not a really strong diversion program in Southern Arizona where there are all over the country that we could use as kind of a roadmap to use. Um, so I think that would be something that we want to look into. And something that I feel like we've identified is a diversion program, maybe a home, um, rehabilitation, things of that nature. SAS focuses on three initiatives. The first being education. The second is law enforcement policy. And the third, Project RACE, a victim-centered diversion program designed to equip Tucson area survivors with the resources they need to reintegrate into society. SAS organizers say everyone needs to be educated to be able to tell the difference between a sex trafficking victim and a prostitute. And it's really important to know the signs of what you're looking for. Um, again, I think the, that in society we have this negative connotation with prostitution and we have a real misunderstanding as to how that comes about and how folks decide to do that. If you would like to know more about Southern Arizona Against Slavery, head over to Kega9.com. Jennifer Martinez, Kega9 on your side. How do you find out about this to stop it? Um, unfortunately, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, first off, I think it's an under-recognized and under-reported crime. Um, the victims, just by the nature of the crime, are already living in fear of the people that are trafficking them, so they're oftentimes afraid to come forward. Um, how we do generally find out about it is somebody recognizes it, the victim escapes and calls law enforcement. How much of your job centers on social media and the Internet? Oh, a lot of it. Um, you know. <laughs> You know, we used to talk about cyber crime uh -huh. as a standalone entity. What I would say is um, every crime is now what I would call just a cyber enabled crime. Computers, smartphones have become such a part of our life. The advertisements often happen um, on social media. Uh, the payments happen sometimes through virtual currencies. Um, so more and more, um, HSI in particular is working to combat those emerging technologies. Living near the border, we hear a lot about human trafficking from Mexico into the United States. Uh, under your purview, how much of this human trafficking is people coming over the border as opposed to people being trafficked here in the U.S. to begin with? Well, just to clarify, human smuggling, uh, which we certainly hear a lot about in the southwest border area, uh, is a separate crime than human trafficking. Um, smuggling uh, is really a crime of transportation. Um, trafficking involves, again, the force, fraud, or coercion, uh, basically to force a person to do an act they would not otherwise do. I'm Ivan Rodriguez. You just heard the stories on human trafficking. Now I tell you about a story on the U.S.-Mexico international border on human smuggling. More than 200,000 people going about their lives in the border town of Nogales, Sonora. Beneath all the noise, a darkness people know exists, but few decide to recognize. Esta por donde vamos es la calle Reforma. This street we're on is Reforma. Here you'll see many migrants walking about. Samuel Lozano is a Jesuit priest with the Kino Project, situated a few hundred feet from the border. They work with migrants who have been deported from the U.S. or smuggled by the cartel. Este lugar, el panteón, en ambos lados. This cemetery is where many migrants who don't have a place to stay and who have used up their three days at the shelter end up sleeping. Rejected by society, these migrants rest alongside the tombstones of others whose fates have been sealed shut. A veces los muertos... Sometimes the dead have a better shelter. Every year, hundreds of migrants from Latin America try crossing into the U.S. Many of them make arrangements with coyotes who help them cross. Usually, coyotes have ties to the cartel and pay a fee for every person they cross. This is one bus terminal in Nogales. Based on several accounts, this is a hotspot for cartels to pick up migrants who are then trafficked. Entonces, en la terminal, cuando llegan, le dicen... So when they get to the terminal, the cartel asks them, are you the person who's been recommended to us? 
their answer can be a matter of life or death. Maria Engracia Robles has been working with the Kino project for the last 12 years. She says most of the time migrants will answer yes because they actually are waiting for their coyote to pick them up. Al padre Samuel se la han hecho. They've done it to Father Samuel before because they thought he was a migrant. Esto está sucediendo ahora. This is happening right now. Every day we hear cases like these. It's incredible. Robles met a man after he was let go by the cartel. He explained to her that he would try getting across again, even after what he survived, being kidnapped for ransom and nearly killed. No tengo otra opción. I don't have a choice, he says. I have kids over there, my wife, my job. In Mexico, I don't even have a place to sleep. Esta realidad tan dramática. This is the reality here. Human trafficking is a business that will never end. El gobierno está the government conmigo. colludes with the cartel, and it's a disaster. Both the priest and the nun say their hope of human smuggling ending is faced by reality. However, they have faith their work here on the border may someday make a difference. Ivan Rodriguez, Kega 9, on your side. I'm Alexa Liaco. Truck drivers are now finding themselves on the front lines of the human trafficking crisis. I sat down with drivers to see how they're banding together to find victims. I didn't think there was a problem like that here in the United States. I thought that was like in third world countries, but I guess that's a problem here and we need to stop that. The problem? Truckers Against Trafficking says thousands of adults and children are forced into sex and labor at truck stops across the country. Truckers are trying to do something with this, and the truckers are being chosen because they're in this field. Uh, they're, they're stopping at the truck stops. Uh, that's where the sex trafficking is at. And drivers say they've seen it firsthand. My dad drove truck for 18 years, and I've been on the road with him. And I've seen this stuff with my own eyes. It's it's one of those things that's really disgusting. I saw no more than a nine-year-old, you know, going from truck to truck in just a span of 30 minutes. But now, HDS Trucking Institute has a special class teaching drivers how to recognize and help victims of human trafficking. Somebody young, you know, a young person like that is no business being in a truck stop. They're kind of a little bit hasty when they talk to you. You try to ask them, you know, are you here by yourself? forced to do this or then they'll they'll kind of try to get away from you but you know that's you know, that's the time when you call the, the law enforcement drivers say this is not something they ever thought they'd have to do but they're ready to step up oh I'm gonna I'm gonna say something there there is no doubt in my mind that I will be the first one to call those law enforcement tell them hey I think I have a suspected child here that's being forced to do something they don't want to do if we can make that one phone call and get that one kid or one person off the street that's in that slavery, I think it'll make the difference. In a way, I feel kind of proud of that, that we can actually be the first line of defense against, you know, trafficking. It's a good thing that we're doing that, that helping law enforcement get that disgusting thing out of the way. The Trucking Institute is now part of a statewide effort to fight human trafficking at truck stops. Drivers now have window stickers with a helpline for victims to call or text in. Truck drivers say they hope to be the lifeline between victims and law enforcement that was never there before. If we can stop one, because it's somebody's daughter, somebody's son that's out there, and, and that's what it's about. Alexa Liaco, Kega 9, on your side. I'm Whitney Clark. I sat down with a mother and her daughter, how they're moving forward after a turbulent few years. Found out on her Twitter page via her sister's mom, have you looked at her Twitter page? And uh, at that point, I looked on the Twitter page and I 
saw my daughter naked on a, on a tile floor, and I'm like, oh my gosh. We first met LaVe Gooden months ago. She attends regular meetings with parents of addicted loved ones. It's a support group with a chapter in Tucson. It's my daughter uh, who was addicted to meth, and it helps me set boundaries, and it helps me cope day to day. Gooden's daughter, Diane, struggled with drug addiction for years, which led her down a darker path. A year ago when my mom was saying you're being sex trafficked, I wouldn't have like I was like, no, like it's my choice, but I, I can really see now that I'm sober and clean that I was being taken advantage of. When LaVey looked at her daughter's social media account, she found out the teen was invited to be part of a pornography. It's like, you know, not my, no, this will never happen to us. And then boy, did my eyes get big and my ears and my mind like explode to what I was dealing with. And as soon as I thought, oh, it can't get any worse, it's like, oh, it's worse. LaVey has told her story to Sold No More, whose mission is to end sex trafficking in Tucson. Along with her daughter, she's managed to cope. Both LaVey and Diane, who is now 18 and living in a shelter, are hopeful and open-minded about the future. This is a hard thing to go through. So you reach out and you don't keep it a secret. And because if you try to deal with this as a secret issue, it just kills you from the inside out, your heart and your soul and your mind. She's 100% right when she says that it has to be my choice because they put me in these expensive places and had me on different meds. And, but it really has to be the person's choice. Whitney Clark, Kagan 9, on your side. And I think that's one of the most important lessons for parents and grandparents to learn is people will do horrible things when they think they've got the anonymity of the internet working on their behalf. Um, know who your kids are talking to on the internet. Ask them questions. If you see their behavior changing, engage with them on that. Um, you know, if they have social media accounts, particularly if they're younger children, you know, make sure you have access to them. Um, kids aren't always honest. That's just part of being a kid. Yeah. Um, so you can't necessarily trust your kid, no matter how good your kid is. Is there anything else that you could tell parents uh, besides just keeping an eye uh, on it that they, they could uh, help them in protecting their kids on the Internet? Look for changes in your kid's behavior. Um, if the kids are changing who their friends are, if they're disassociating themselves with kids that have long been their friends, if they're changing their kind of their social networks um, in the real world, um, that may indicate that they're having more um, extensive contacts um, in the fake in the internet world. Yeah. Um, you know, watch for changes in patterns of dress. Um, you know, if your child didn't generally wear revealing clothing and now they are, um, or if they're dressing more as an adult than as a child. Um, ask questions. Let them know there's no shame um, in being trafficked and if you want to present uh, help other people avoid going through the same horrific experience um, come forward. Let law enforcement know. We're here to help you. We're here to support you. Um, again I would say that every agency um, efforts um, in tackling crime have really shifted to a more victim-centric approach. Um, you know, we're not just out there to get the bad guys, we're there to take care of the victims of crime as well. Your final thoughts, I know you mentioned parents need to really be involved in their children's lives, monitoring their devices. Oh, absolutely, it needs to happen. There are so many applications that are on the phone right now, and a perpetrator will exploit any application where they can communicate with a victim any application that's out there. And parents do not need to be afraid. They need to get into those devices and they need to be checking who are they speaking to, who their child's texting, who they're speaking to, and verify who those people are before it's too late. I often tell parents that I've done classes with and I've talked to victims, and the one thing that I always tell them is I cannot undo what will happen to you. And so parents need to keep that in mind when they're looking at their child's phone. They can either look at their phone and feel as if they're invading a little bit of their privacy, or you have the other side where you can't take back what's going to happen to your child if you don't.